This episode of Grilled is sponsored by Rationale, your leading provider in multifunctional hot food preparation equipment. Register now for a free Rationale Live demo at www.rationale-online.com. Right, anyone listening to this podcast, um, please be aware there is some uh, colourful language in there and then certain subjects might be difficult for certain people to listen to as well. If you are listening to around young children, um, I'd suggest that you listen in a little later because it is really fun, it is really interesting and I am a chef and uh, it's just, you know, we're just being natural and we're just having a laugh so uh, it's not meant to offend anyone but there is some colourful language. Welcome to Grilled. I want to eat on the roof whenever I want to eat on the roof, not when you want me to eat it. I just remember Brad's smell of his beard. You just had the biggest, fluffiest beard and I was like, God, he smells so good. <laughs> I don't know why, it's weird. Sometimes you put smell or something to it and I just remember that, well, it's a bit bizarre. Why are you and your chef's white cellar? Are you working? I'm cooking burgers. <laughs> oh, burgers. <laughs> I hope they're not McDonald's. And I just lash it all over the hot toast as it melts and quickly munch it up, crunchy, crunchy, munchy. Dying to get like a piece of your culinary penis in or around their mouth. Welcome to Grilled by The Staff Canteen. Um, I'm Cara, editor of The Staff Canteen, and I am once again joined by Akhtar Islam, who is my co-host for um, the six episodes in this particular part of the series. Um, Akhtar, I normally ask you how you've been, but I know you've had a very interesting day, so uh, yeah, what happened been, to uh, you today? <laughs> it's been a day full of dramas, but um, we've had um, disappearing plumbers. Um, yeah, it just... It, the day started off with just really bad plumbing. So we're, we're building this uh, new uh, production facility for our at-home stuff and um, and a few other exciting stuff that we're bringing out with that that site. But yeah, we're just having an absolute nightmare getting the, all the trades to finish the, their jobs off. And uh, one particular individual who happens to be the plumber seems to have had the, the, the worst week ever, you know, is people dying, cars blowing up, all that. But pretty much every excuse not to turn up on the job. And then... Um, we, we, myself, Neil Frost, and a few of the other senior guys, we're over at the new site trying to get it um, going and uh, get it finished. So we left this uh, Ophim with all the commies. So all the commies have been knocking around there. And um, yeah, they decided to uh, put 600 kilos worth of uh, stock into uh, the lift, the goods lift, and put the kitchen porter in with it. So you can imagine what happened. So poor guy stuck in there. We, we get a call, we're running back, trying to find someone to come out. Thankfully, it was only in there for about half an hour. But yeah, it's been, it's been a fun day. And um, just so you know, the, the, the mess behind me, that's actually one of those, you know, you can choose those Zoom backgrounds. It's a green. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I've got to say that getting your kitchen port of stock in a lift full of beef is the best excuse I've had for someone possibly not being able to make the podcast. So well done on that one. <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm all about originals and first, so, uh, but no, I'm, I'm, you know, uh, as soon as I got it fixed, I had to, because I've been dying to speak to Callum, because... Well, yeah, let's I, introduce Callum properly, because I know you like to jump in there, at time, and I have to stop you before I do my intro first, so... Oh, it's like Hang on. <laughs> right, let me introduce our guest. Um, he has his fingers in a lot of pies, but I'm sorry, couldn't help that one. Um, <laughs> not only is he exec chef at Holborn Dining Room, but he runs the Pie Room and recently published his first uh, book by the same name. It's the Pie King himself, Callum Franklin. Uh, welcome Hello. to Grilled. <laughs> Hello. Thank you for having me on. Oh, we're very excited. Well, Acta is particularly excited. So I, one of my first questions was going to be, have you met each other before? But... Obviously, actor, you said that you haven't. So uh... haven't. no, no, no. Um, obviously, I've known. Uh, well, the trade is being as it is. We all sort of know each other, and we interact, you know, various ways through social media and stuff. But you know, Callum, someone I've, I've been dying to meet because we've got a lot of mutual friends, and and believe it or not, everyone actually says uh, good things about you. So, uh, oh, that's really kind, yeah. man. But yeah, you know, Thank Brad. You. Brad you know, when you did some bits with him, and like, you know, I was just blown away with some of the stuff that you do, and I, th I think what you're doing is it's incredible for 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 hospitality and and food from britain you know what we're what we're about and you've you know the niche that you have something that i think we all love and that's so often been ignored over the years and and what you've done you've just you just brought it to the forefront and just moving it and elevating to 
to to levels it's never seen before, mate. I'm gushing. That's <laughs> very very kind. Thank you. No, no, it's incredible. I, 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 yeah. I think it's you. Okay. Yeah, I love it. I'm going to throw something back at you then, because I wanted to say this quite early, right? Because I saw the video the other day. I think it was a video of your new site, right? Yeah. That you've taken on. And I genuinely, I saw that and I was just like, wow. Like someone who's turned like a really pretty crap situation into something amazing. And I was I like showed all my chefs. I was like, that's that's pretty incredible. Someone's like creating jobs. They're you know doing something really pretty special out of a really tough tough situation. So like hats off to you, dude. I was I was really really impressed. God, there's so much love in this podcast already. We've only just started. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be fighting in about half an hour. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's, I was going to say, how are your pie pastry skills? You know, what? I love, I, I do love good pie. Um, I, I do enjoy it. Um, I, I don't make it as often as I do. I think I sort of put myself off uh, quite a few years, but I did uh, for Great British Menu. I decided to do a, a miniature rabbit pie and to make all the delicate bits. I mean, it was taking me about half an hour, 45 minutes for each one. And um I think that sort of put me off making it because it was so intricate. We'll put the little leaves on there. And, you know, each one was probably no bigger than, I don't know, 50 pence piece inside. So it was really, really dainty. But um, I, I, I admire Callum. Like, the, the artistry is fucking incredible. But, yeah, I mean, I, I, lo I love a good pie. Some of the um, We have it once once a week as uh, staff food. So um, even in the summer, you know, it's, it's, it's definitely a... A must so yeah we all enjoy it. and it's something about a pie think about it you know you've got that beautiful crust um you know it's all about the textures right and 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 you know rich crust and then you've got that beautiful warm rich filling and, and i like cold pies as well so i love like cl classic cold pork pie as well so anyway i think you can gather i, I love pies so <laughs> not as, I, I love them more than i love uh, that i enjoy making them so i love eating them more should i say well, we will talk more more pies after we've done my lovely wheel of truth, which I've added new questions to. Um, so let's get going with that. Um, Callum, as you're the guest, um, you can go first. <laughs> Do you think aliens exist? I think I've worked with some, to be fair, <laughs> <laughs> over the years. Uh, no, I, to be honest with you, I'm going to go no. I loved the X-Files as a kid, but it was a great TV show, isn't it? But no. No? No. <laughs> no. Okay. <laughs> Actually, you're laughing. Do you, do you believe in aliens? <laughs> well, the thing is... I, I, and, oh, here we go. <laughs> this, is this is where we fall out. That's the end of the year. The, 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 the bromance that was going to be, that's never to be now. But no, I just think um, if you look at how vast the universe is and if you look at the endless possibilities because you know the, the amount of galaxies that, that that are out there apparently you know oh yeah yeah you know there's, there's you know yeah, yeah. There's, there's more galaxies than there are grains of sand on this planet you know so each galaxy is a collection of millions and billions of stars each one being a solar system in its own right it, it it's i find i think the the, the notion and that's where i think i fall, fall out with um you know religion and stuff like that they that the fact that we are we are so special that we are just unique in that sense that you know across the entire universe that we are the only ones out there now i'm not saying you know that they come over on like pie shaped ships because they you know these sources are like pies don't um or the, the you know they come over and visit us and, and and take us or whisk us away to do funny things to us and send us back and we we don't you know that stuff let's put that out the window i think the possibility it's it's hard to discount that. Yeah, do you know what? Actar's answer was much better than mine. <laughs> I, you know, I meant yeah. I, I'd like to. I have to clarify my answer. I just meant there wasn't, you know, ET or like yeah, guys doing probes and stuff. But hundred percent, right? They find water on planets, so definitely there's like yeah, there's 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 life outside of ours. Um, I yeah, they're just I don't think they're little green men. 
That's what I meant to say. Sorry. I take, <laughs> I take, take some of mine back. 100% with Akhtar on that. Yeah. But going back to working with them, it's little green men are usually commies after we've had a staff night out and the following day yeah. in the morning <laughs> when, you're, when you're putting breakfast in front of them and, and you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, they've had one too many. So uh, I think it was the last time we had a, we had a night out and uh, one of the uh, younger commies was absolutely plastered and actually was actually sick. And the other one was like, He's okay. He just drank too much, and now it's all coming out. So, like, mate, we, we understand the process. I've been We've all done it. Yeah. I know what's happened. <laughs> <laughs> it's just the way he explained it to me. Like the other one's almost like saying, you know, had his back and say, "It's okay. He just drank too much, and it's just coming out now." But yeah, we can all see. <laughs> Thanks for the clarification. Yeah. <laughs> so we're in agreement that there are other life forms, just not little green men. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> right, Axel. This is a nice one. What's your proudest moment? Uh, I'd say moments. Um, personally, in my personal life, you know, my son, you know, you know, he is everything to me. Um, you know, is one my one and only son, and um, and um, long may that be the case because I'm definitely not one for having more kids. Um, but yeah, I mean. Yeah, I mean, it's just so much joy, and and it's it's a bittersweet situation because, um, you know, he gave up a lot for me to do what I wanted to do, and you know, on reflection, I look back and sometimes I think you know I've missed out on so much. So you know, the, the little videos that I got of him when he was a kid, I, I often I still you know look back at those pretty much on a daily basis because I, I sort of missed out on that, and I and. That's me personally, and that's almost quite selfish because he missed out on a lot more because he never had me, you know. And I remember when I when he was a kid, uh, was, I think it was about three or four. So he's just getting his work. Well, it was about three actually. He's getting his words together, and you know, I'd, I'd go and see him in the afternoons in a break uh, before I come back to his service for dinner, and it, you know, it, it the, he couldn't string his sentences together, but he'd say, "Daddy, no ghost work," and you know, and he just because he didn't want me to go to work and. Uh, because he wanted to spend more time with me. So, you know, yeah, my son, you know, the birth of my, my son, uh, my other two, uh, three proudest moments. So the other two, I like my, well, they're my, my furry sons. So we've got Bailey and Teddy, when they came into my life, I, you know, anyone who knows that I'm, I'm like, I am mad about my two pups. And then um, obviously getting the star, but the star was more, you know, it's something that I've worked towards my whole life. And, you know, to get that was, it was just incredible. But I felt more joy for everyone who'd been on that journey with me. So, you know, Neil, for example, you know, we both, when, when, we, when we got the email, we sort of knew which way it's going. Um, you know, we're both grown men and, you know, we're old and ugly. And, um, you know, we're, we're around, the, around the back having a cry. And, you know, we're just hugging each other and crying because we, we, for the last 10 years, we've worked together and to be able to achieve what we wanted to. So that, that was incredible. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Yeah. Oh, three very good ones there. Very good ones. Um, right, Callum. So you can make a pie for any celebrity. <laughs> Who would it be and what pie would you make? Mm. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I like, my idol in life, I think because I relate a lot to him in the way he behaves, um, is Larry David from Curb Your Enthusiasm. He was the writer of Seinfeld. And uh, he's just like the most socially awkward person on the planet, right? And I, <laughs> I have at least one situation a day which is horrifyingly socially awkward because I can be an idiot in social situations. So, yeah, I've always wanted to meet him. Um, and I think, you know, he, he kind of plays a character on TV, but it's based on him. It's actually him. So, uh, yeah, I get... Uh, and it would probably be something like uh, salt beef pie, because he's Jewish, I think, something like that. Oh, okay. Yeah. But I know that if I met him... He would be socially awkward and I'd be socially awkward and it would be an awful time. <laughs> right? that's, that's probably what would happen. I don't but. think anyone else would want to be at that table. No, no, <laughs> I don't know. 
<laughs> yeah, we'd all just want to be next to it, just watching. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's like a black star imploding. Yeah. <laughs> right, final one for you, Adjar. Oh, this is a good one for you. What's the most romantic thing you've ever done? Because I know you have such a good time with the ladies. <laughs> God. Thank, uh, thank God I didn't get this one. <laughs> um, well, definitely. Um, uh, I don't, uh, oh, actually, it's, make, make something up. Amazing. I tell you what, I'm not, I'm not really that way inclined. I, like, I find a lot of it, that, that sort of stuff like sort of like cliched. And I remember once we, I was on a holiday with my... Uh, obviously now ex-girlfriend um and um we're in uh, thailand and she wanted to go to this waterfall because she had this magical day planned uh that we're gonna go to this beautiful waterfall in the in the middle of the jungle blah 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 great and we walked for about about two hours and all the time i was thinking about fuck i'd much rather be at the bar sipping a gin because it's a beautiful afternoon I wanted to chill and you know I made a hobby of drinking gin around the world so you know that, that was that that was my plan but I didn't did, didn't plan to walk through a jungle for two and a half hours but anyway I was sort of miffed about that so we got to the end and got to this water where, what was supposed to be this waterfall and it just turned out to be you know where you got like a dripping tap because there's not had any rain for about a week beforehand so the river had dried up so there's no fucking waterfall so yeah that was probably the closest I got to being romantic ever. <laughs> and it wasn't even your idea. I know. <laughs> Nailed it. <laughs> and now you can understand why I'm single. But anyway, <laughs> people always wonder, actor, why are you single? I mean, a man who can cook, blah, blah, blah. Um, and now you know. <laughs> All those visions of being able to stand underneath this flowing waterfall yeah. and take these beautiful pictures and uh, actually, no, you're just going to stand on a dried up puddle. <laughs> <laughs> I loved it though. I absolutely loved it. <laughs> <laughs> right. Let's talk pies because I know we briefly started to talk about it. Callum, take us back to when this all started because I, I first met you at Holborn Dining Room and it must have been one of the first I think we were one of the first chefs that I met in this job so it must be seven years ago or something around mm. that time it's a really long time and the pies weren't a big thing then we didn't we definitely didn't really discuss it I know we didn't and that room that is that bit that's now the pie room it wasn't the pie room then was it so where did this all come from uh so yeah I mean it goes back about now I think it's five years ago we uh, basically we've got this the building we're in is uh 113 years old right it's this beautiful building in, in uh Holborn in London and over the years it's been lots of different things um it has been hotels at different points so basically there's this basement store which we call the Aladdin's Cave well that's what the chefs call it right and that's where uh there's been stuff there from from all its sort of iterations over over that century and um we would find stuff down there like uh silver service trolleys just there right and we'd get them refurbished by silversmiths and 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 try and put stuff into use in the restaurant and basically one day i was rummaging around i think i was looking for something to plate a dish on and um i found this old pie tin this antique pie tin and I knew it was a pie tin but I didn't know specifically the technique for using it right because it kind of had interlocking parts and, and keys to put it together and I just thought well that's pretty shit that you don't know how to do that right it's like a traditional British technique and you know you've been cooking for 20 years so I went upstairs and took it to my senior sous chef at the time there's a guy called David Burke. And David was like, I mean, David's opened some of the biggest restaurants in his country over his career. You know, he's, Dave's just retired, actually. He's, he was getting on a bit, but he uh, uh, super experienced. And he looked at me and he's like, I haven't got a clue. Right. So I asked the kitchen. I right, was so 35 chefs and no one in that kitchen knew how to do it. So I kind of identified a glaring problem for me running a British restaurant um, that kind of preached you know to an extent traditional British food that we didn't know this technique so from that moment we kind of went on a little journey 
um, which kind of like stretched out to other things as well, like sausage making and stuff like that. But specifically, what really interested me was pie making. And I was like, you know, I love pies. My guests love pies. We're surrounded by sort of old school law firms. You know, that's our sort of bread and butter at, at lunchtime. Um, and yeah, I just sort of put more and more savoury pastry, traditional savoury pastry on the menu. And then it got to a point where um, we were doing everything in the main kitchen, which is kind of like, as most main kitchens are, pretty hectic, pretty busy uh, and hot. And it was just too much pressure on the team. So all the senior chefs were kind of making sure that stuff got done whilst, you know, trying to do their job and trying to like check, check dishes and check mise en place. And I kind of got to a point where I was like, all right, I'm getting a bit carried away with it. So we either stop here and keep it at this level, or if we want to progress, then I need to build a space for it. And that's where the pie room came into play. Um, but, you know, it's my obsession with it is that, uh, yeah, I'm, a, I'm a, my brain is slightly weird in terms of like detail and, and uh, I like, uh you know following mythology method method well following a method <laughs> <laughs> can't even say the bloody word but i'm obsessed with it um but yeah i and pie making falls into that right so yeah that's kind of where it all came from originally right and so in terms of like pie you've obviously started there and then i mean some of the things like at all you're saying some of the things you see on your instagram are just insane what you can do with a pie yeah, <laughs> so. it's, it's incredible how you, you you know you've made it your thing like you know like it's it, you know when i think about pies when i think about you know trad british food you know you're you're one of the names and the faces that come up because you, you you've almost become synonymous with that in in such a short space of time as well i mean it is it is incredible what you do and like you know the journey so you, you have to learn how to obviously use the traditional apparatus but like the whole process of learning how to make these traditional pies and different, because obviously all the pastries are different. It's not about the fillings, not always about just differentiating between the fillings. And you've got the hot, cold and everything else. Like, how, mm. What was that journey about? Yeah, I mean, I think that the, the beauty of it is, right, which is one thing that, that, that keeps me sort of, keeps the fire going all the time, is that you can go down the route of, at any time, you can go down the route of, okay, how do we make the perfect pork pie, right? Nothing else on the plate, just the ultimate pork pie, best pastry, best filling, you know, the best way of cooking it. Or you can do the stuff like I do when I did the thing at the dinner with Brad, where I said to my team, okay, I want to do a pie, but I want to have a acid house face running down the middle of it, right? Made out of sausage. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that, you know, the, those two extremes mean that we're constantly pushing the barriers in terms of, you know, technique and new technique versus very old school classical technique as well. And they merge quite well together. Um, Was the and, journey and, yeah, getting yeah. That, that classical nailed and then moving or did you almost just decide this is my way or I'm going to almost re-engineer the way it's going to be done. It's going to be done in a fashion. Oh, it's, it's, yeah. I mean, that's up and down all the time. So I, you know, we, I go through periods where I'm like, okay, let's do something like wacky, like out there. I really want to try something new. And then the next week we're back again to fo focusing on the basics and, you know, like pinpointing just the, the best short cross recipe that we can possibly make. But yeah, I, I, in that sense, I'm slightly scatty with those things. But I think it's the the new stuff that keeps the chefs interested, and you know, they they see stuff and they're like, "Wow, I've, you know, how how do we get to this point?" Um, but you you have to keep it grounded all the time with that, like, "Okay, let's do this," and and just do the best version of it that's as possible. And clearly, the, yeah. the pie shop is is popular, right? Hmm. Yeah, and, and, you know, from the pie shop, we serve hot and cold pies through the windows, and they are, like, pretty homely, simple pies with just very good versions of them. Uh, but 
when you're buying one of those, you can watch right in front of you a chef just doing something nuts with pastry, right? <laughs> and that's one of the sort of beauties of that room is that all that those things are right there in front of you on display. You're seeing it being made. And uh, yeah, I mean, we were working on something the other day. Um, we've got a new sort of project that we're working on called the Pyramid Pie. And uh, it, it, yeah, it's, I, I'm not going to go into too much detail because it's something we've worked on for ages. And it's, it's a cool thing, but it involves, you know, new technology that I think that other chefs aren't yet sort of tapping into as much. Um, because, yeah, I, and it, I, I don't know. When we, I, what's cool is that I sit with my team and we talk about these things and they kind of look at me and say, you know, that's bonkers, we won't work. And then we work it out, you know, and we sit there at the end of a process and everyone's like, oh, that was pretty cool, you know, and it's just doing doing that sort of brainstorming with my chefs I love it like yeah I love that little journey we go on each time going back to like um the earlier like you know obviously it all started off from that old um the the the, the, the pie pie tin that you know that, mm. that from antiquity so we do a lot of um research and we look into like recipes going as far back as you know 13 1400 so yeah some of the recipes that you come across are a bit fucking weird and uh, you know, almost like it's a fairy tale, not actually a recipe. Like one of them, um, it's a dish from Hyderabad where he says to go out and collect the morning dew. Like, yeah, fuck me. Like, yeah, I mean, but some of the stuff people like, have you come across weird recipes or stuff? Yeah, that stood out for like, sure, man. What, yeah, what, what, would you, what would you? I mean, yeah, we very much do the same, right? So I work quite closely with the food historian at the British Library. Um, Polly Russell, who's amazing. And, you know, we get to look at some very cool old books kind of under, you know, the watch of security guards and stuff. And uh, same thing, you know, there's stuff in, I was reading the other day about a pie that was served at a banquet where there was a band inside it, right? <laughs> it's, a, it's a musical band. It was just this huge pie. Obviously they weren't in there when it was cooked, but they took the lid off and there was a band playing inside. Now, that sort of thing, you know, I, I don't look at that and go, oh, how can we recreate that? But um, Oh, that's a yeah. shame. <laughs> yeah. But I do, I do definitely look back at some of those historical recipes. One of the reasons we do it is because we look at them and we say, OK, this is what they did. Quite often you see pic like hand-drawn pictures and they're sort of these majestic, huge pies, which are like, when you look at them vertically, you think, okay, that's impossible to do with pastry because it will collapse in the oven. And then the more you look into it, you realize that the pastry that they used wasn't edible, it was a salt crust. And that's what supported it and held it up in the oven. So we look at, okay, how do we recreate that using the knowledge we have now and the techniques we have now and make it all edible? And that's where the challenge is, right? And uh, that's how, you know, those things progress. And I don't think that's against tradition. This is a big thing that I, I kind of talk about a lot is that, you know, some pie makers don't like me because I, I kind of talk about using new techniques and, and making things better. But that's how, you know, tradition always progresses, right? And I can see that looking through history books. There's always, there was a point where pie crust wasn't eaten. It was just there as a you know protection, and then there's a period of time where people started to eat it because they were like, "Oh, we should eat this. It's actually really good." Um, so things always progress, but yeah, I think just you can pay respect to tradition, but shouldn't be afraid of trying to advance things as well, right? That's, that is definitely one of the things. Like <clears throat> you know, and I'm the classy other pioneer. I hope you don't. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm you know. I, 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 what you're doing with pies, you know, for me, I, seriously, I'm, I'm not saying it for the sake of this. You know, I, I bloody admire what you're doing. And, you know, for me, I, I, I take inspiration from you because I, I see some of my earlier journey as well, because, you know, I got into, I got a lot of slack for and a lot of um, kicking from the Asian community, should I say, or chefs, because of my, I guess, my approach to Indian food, which is obviously very different to theirs. Um, but you know, I stuck stuck with it, and here I am today. And and I think for you as well, you know, I can certainly understand why you will get some some people who who will almost fight against it because not because they 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 fear you or you you know you make them feel 
um, in any way less uh, lesser chefs or, or but it's more a case of you know traditions an incredible thing where some people just follow it blindly without understanding that you know human nature is you know progression that's that's yeah. how we become and look how we've progressed over the last hundred years it's part and parcel of who we are and you know sadly progression isn't always welcomed by everyone unanimously so you know I can totally understand the journey that you're going through. Do you get um, any strange requests, Callum, for certain pies? And I mean, I know you've done some amazing ones and like, you know, the one particularly for Brad Carter was was like amazing. But do you get any strange requests for pies where you're like, oh, I don't know if we can yeah, do that? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's part of the fun, right? I mean, we get commissioned quite a lot by people to do something unusual. And I think one of the, the ones that I really sort of enjoyed, it was for... It was a pitch for a TV show that a production company were presenting to a channel. Uh, and I think the show was called, oh, I can't remember it. It was something that I think it was on Netflix or, or something like that. And it was, uh, Heston was one of the people on it. And it was all about like wacky food, right? And they said to me, uh, we would like you, if possible, to create like a mechanical pie, right? A pie, like something that moves around, but is still edible. And uh, I was just like, yeah, cool, I'll do it. Like, <laughs> 200 quid, let's do it. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so I mean, it was back in the day before I understood the value of things. And um, yeah, and I, you know, the first thing I did was start drawing. And then there was a point where I was in Hamleys on Oxford Street, right? Uh, on Regent Street, sorry. And um, I was running around Hamleys with one of the people that works there looking for this sort of mechanical part of a toy and I was just I just stopped and I was like my job's fucking amazing you know <laughs> like <laughs> what is going on do you know what I mean I, it wasn't that long ago I was getting beasted on the veg section and now I'm running around Hamleys looking for a mechanical piece for a pie but I ended up building this pie that um it looked like it if I held it up to you like that I think actually it may be on my Instagram a long long time ago but if you held the pie up it looked fairly normal and then when you put it down on the table this central part of the pie came up and then turned around by itself and it had the logo of the tv show and uh at the end you could just step away and it's kind of this moving so like stuff like that i love doing right i mean the one we did for tom carriage actually that wasn't a request but that was the most technically challenging thing we've ever done and it was i was doing a dinner with Tom's team uh, at the shed in Marlow. So super cool, like, I think it's like eight people or 10 people you cook for. And Tom was like, look, if you can do something that's kind of a bit out there as one of the courses, I'd love it. So for a while I was kind of, you know, lots of sleepless nights thinking about what we're gonna do, what we're gonna do. And then I spoke to Knox. Now Knox is a chef that runs the pie room day to day for me, who's brilliant. and. Uh, Actually, yesterday was seven years of working together. So it was a really nice sort of milestone for us. Um, but I was like, oh, have you ever seen in France, they used to do this thing where when you slice this kind of rectangular pie, the pâté en croûte, there has a clock face in it, right? So every slice has this clock face on it. And, that, and she was like, yeah, but they do the Roman numerals on it which is nuts in itself, right? <laughs> How you get no Roman numerals running down this clock face down the center of a pie made out of sausage. That's nuts in itself. But she said, I've always seen when chefs slice it, they paint on the hands of the clock afterwards with squid ink. And I was like, well, we're going to work out how to do it without doing that. So we can change the time on it as you slice it, right? And I think we spent weeks trying to work out the sort of how you make that work with sausage making and uh and it was like right from the basics we had cucumbers we were kind of cutting cucumbers trying to work out how it might be possible and we got it to work in the end and it was like yeah we sat these guests down they had no idea kind of how much time and and sort of effort went into that but we had this big rectangular pie that said uh pate philippe down the side of it like patek philippe and I said, look, I'm going to cut this and hopefully it's going to tell us the time. It's like a, 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 a clock inside a pie. 
and I cut it and it was the wrong time, but I knew it was, right? And they're all like, oh, it's a shame. You know, it's the wrong time. And I was like, oh, yeah. Sometimes these things, you need to give them a shake. So I shook it and then I cut it and it was bang on the time in the room. And they were like, ah, it's amazing. Oh like, that's God. like, yeah, super, <laughs> super satisfying. But the hilarious thing about that story is that I got the Roman numerals for nine wrong. <laughs> <laughs> After like months of trying to practice and get that thing right, I, that I fell down on something really ridiculous, was, which was instead of just doing like I, X, I did V, I, 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 I. So I made, my, I made it much harder for myself. <laughs> Probably added hours and hours of work on, but uh, I'll never, I'll never, <laughs> it's weird, I'll never forgive myself for that mistake. I, I'll, always, I'll always look at it and think I didn't get it right, but. But as we've established, like I'm like this uh, amazing romantic guy, right? As it, what came to my mind? Has anyone asked you to bake a, a ring into a pie or anything like? Because obviously we get it. Like you know, there's that particular time of year yeah. you know, that, time that everyone goes fucking stupid and uh, they want you to put rings in stuff. You know, that not time. you, actor. Yeah, that, that kind of. Ugh. Anyway, yeah. So, yeah. Do you get? Like, that? Do you know what? I, I've not done that, but I do a lot of wedding pies. So instead of wedding cakes, people want nice. sort of big tiered pie cakes. And actually, one of the first massive commissions I did was for Niall Keating's wedding. Oh. So I did, we did it for him, and uh, yeah, I loved doing that. But the coolest thing I've done like that was it was a couple who came to the restaurant a lot and really cool young couple they were getting married and they said to me look we're gonna have a sort of fancy pants wedding at the hotel but as soon as the ceremony's done we want to come and have a pie masterclass in your pie room with you with you know me and my husband and you know our parents so we had this masterclass. She's in a wedding gown and he's in his like morning suit making pies. It was just nuts. They were like, yeah, we just want to do what we enjoy on the day. And, uh, and I was like, I respect that. But it was very cool. It was very cool. That is very cool. As it, when you became a chef, Callum, did you ever think your journey would take you <laughs> to where you are now? Never, you know. I mean, I don't know. I mean, when I, when I joined the industry, I think it was... I'm sure I like Actar's memories of this. It was 15, 20 years ago. It was pretty tough. The kitchens were pretty rough and tough. And uh, you, there, was, there was probably a handful of chefs at the time in the UK who really were successful. And, uh, and that's changed, obviously, right? So at the time, you kind of, you can still be really competitive at that age and, and really want something. But that goal is like, pretty distant right and and to think now kind of to have done all the cool stuff that I've got to do and and to meet all the cool people I've met like even to just be talking to you two now like this is uh, an achievement for me I love I love the fact that I'm talking to you two right now um but yeah I I know I, I I never thought that but again same with the pies you know I mean um I always was interested in sort of technical work but if you'd asked me 10 years ago when I was cooking fine dining, I probably would not have said that I'd end up pie making. You know, I probably would have looked down on it, to be honest with you. But now, you know, I see people see me in, in the street in London and shout pie man at me. I love it. <laughs> love it. My wife hates it. But I love it. <laughs> No, it's like I said, it's, you know, coming into the industry, you live, you would never have thought that, that is because this is what you're known for now. So it's it's yeah. mad, isn't it, to think how probably if you look back, how far and how different uh, your life has become. So it's yeah, really absolutely. Interesting. really interesting. And I think, you know, what Callum said there as well, you know, back in that, you know, 15, 20 years ago, I think anyone who really wanted to progress in this industry the, the direction you went down was fine dining, right? That's it's just naturally mm. in your head. You think that that's the way forward, or that's what you uh, just just move towards because through aspiration. But you know, to think, yeah, you're right. You know, if if you know you, yourself 15, 20 years ago, to tell yourself, well, you know, you're going to be famous for no making fucking pies. And yeah, that's that's what you're going to be known for. 
Jim Stan, I mean, yeah, I, I think that, that that you know back then you'd probably sit there and think, "Fuck, I I, I would really have fucked up in my you know." In my yeah, career. yeah, absolutely, yeah. right? Yeah, I mean, totally. At, at that point in my career, I probably, I, I'm sure I would, would have looked down at some of doing that. But I think, yeah, I think the world the world of food changed so much in that period of time that you don't look at it like that anymore. Right. For sure, and I think you know it's one of the great things. I think food's become so liberated now, and cooking's become so liberated now. You know, if fine dining is the way you want to go, and you know, highly technical cooking, that's the way you want to go. That's that's great. But then you've got guys who've worked with us and been, you know, fine dining. They've spent their whole life in fine dining restaurants and high end kitchens to go and just do knockout street food and earn a living from that and love every minute of it. It's it's, yeah. it's amazing, isn't it? I, I just think it's. It's it's so liberating. They're so free, and people are able to express themselves. And no one looks down on someone for spending ten years working at starred restaurants, and then suddenly deciding, you know what? What I want to do now, I want to make donuts. That's my thing. Yeah. You know what? Everyone celebrates that. Now we all, you know, we look at that. And we think, you know, what? fair play, fucking great. And and we wish, you know, we wish everyone all the success and enjoy what they do because obviously the the, the donuts that they end up with because they've decided to do that out of passion are always some of the best you'll ever get or, or, or you know kebabs and and you know hot dogs i've got a mate of mine who worked in kitchens you know to fine dining kitchens for years and now he, he does hot dogs and makes sausages fucking great and i just it's it's, it's incredible where the industry yeah. has come and how it's changed yeah yeah totally agree yeah, no, definitely. And it's obviously just shows how diverse it can be, doesn't it? So there's so many different avenues that you can do go down as part of hospitality. So um, Yeah, and that's that's one of the most exciting things to kind of, you know, to, I know we're going to touch on it later about the sort of future of the industry, but I, I say that to young people all the time, like they, looking at what we do here in this kitchen, this is not everything, right? Like there is a world of of mad stuff out there for you to go and enjoy like that's one of the coolest things about this job yeah no definitely well I mean let's talk about it now so, you know um why you know encouraging the next generation and uh, act how we touched on it um I think it was our last podcast wasn't it with with Nigel and just what an amazing industry it is that that narrative I think it's just gone on for a too long where we where, where we as an industry have almost been browbeaten into accepting where uh, an industry that uh, promotes bullying and you know harsh working conditions and all the negative stuff and we forget about all the great things and the great opportunities like something that I've always said like you know for a guy like me who came from inner city Birmingham you know born of immigrant parents you know my parents always did their best you know father's always had his business it's always been you know but we, we grew up in a, an area where it's almost it was, it, it's a ghetto it was a ghetto back then it is now and most of my childhood friends people I grew up with they're either dead in prison or, you know, their life is dedicated to crime. It's cooking that took me away from that. It's hospitality that took me out of that and allowed me to aspire for more and achieve more. So how can this industry that's so vilified, how can it provide someone with a background like mine? I've got no, I don't even have a GCSE because I got kicked out of school when I was 13. And how can something that's supposed to be so horrible and such a cruel industry gives someone like me really with nothing apart from the the willingness and the ability to work hard the opportunities that it, I've, I've enjoyed how can that yeah. be a bad industry yeah i think uh i mean to to a large large extent one of the absolute beauties of this industry is that it's kind of a level playing field when you get into it right so what you make of of your career is is almost entirely down to you as a human being right how much you're willing to put in how hard you're willing to work and the decisions that you make now there are going to be shit people in every industry that's a given right but generally i think at the moment it is a fairly level playing field and i think that the media is changing to support that as well Right. Slowly it is in order in, in, in order to uh, illuminate people um, that potentially weren't before. Um, and it's it, everything is just getting to a point now where it is entirely on you, which is great. Right. And I say that to a lot of my young chefs. It's like when you come in this kitchen, 
your success is purely down to the decisions you make in the morning when you're on your way in. That's it. All right. It's, you, you know, if you want to get up late and come in late, it's up to you. Right. You probably won't go very far in our kitchen. If you want to put the work in, you will progress quickly here. And, and yeah, I love that. And I love seeing that moment that light goes on in chef's heads and then watch them sort of soar. And so one of the things that we, I always tell all the, the, the younger kids and, you know, we've just had an intern join us from, uh, from France and, and he's, he's just started with us. And one of the early conversations we always have with people is, you know, when you're, when you're there and when you're in the kitchen, it's not about just doing the little jobs that you've been given. It's about doing those as well as you can so you're given the opportunity to do more so you can learn mm. more. So when you're doing more, it's not as though oh, they're overworking me or I'm working more than I should do. The more you do, the more you learn. And remember, what you've learned can never be taken back. That's yours for life. And, yeah. and that, 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 that's the thing that I always say to these kids. That's, I, mean, I started off as a porter, you know, peeling yeah. onions, washing plates. And this, this is before the days we had bloody dishwashers. So everything was done by hand. And you got that done as quickly as you can. You got all the, the crappy jobs like peeling veg and all that done as quickly as you can so you can learn other stuff. And yeah. I, you didn't sit there and think to yourself, well, I'm only going to do this because that's part of my role and I don't want to do it anymore because I'll be working too hard and I'm giving the business more than I should do, blah, blah, blah. For me, it's everything I learned, I kept it, it's, it. You know, They can't take that back. No one can take that back from you. So you should be, it's all about that. And it's like what you said earlier on, it's about that attitude. Like what do you come, what attitude do you come in to work with? Do you come in and think to myself, today I'm going to do what my job really well and I'm going to learn something new as well. And I'm going to, and, 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 and that's that. If you've got that attitude and those who have that attitude, they always do really well. Yeah. Um, you said earlier that obviously the kitchens when you first started were quite tough. Um, do you think that the generation of chefs that like yourselves that are coming that are now in charge of kitchens and you didn't may maybe like that environment? It's not something that that you want in your own kitchen. Do you think that's maybe what's changing the landscape across the across the board and, and making it a, a, maybe a nicer environment? Yeah, I think. Definitely. I think that, that is a large part of it that, you know, uh, people are understanding that things don't have to be the way they were. I think that's something that we all know now. Um, but, and I think this is a really important point, I think that the generation of people coming through now are different as well and in a re really positive way, right? I mean, uh, they don't want to hear sexist jokes. They don't want to hear racist jokes. They don't want to have all these things that were so sort of saturated in the industry when I started, right? That was just a normal commonplace to hear the like pretty awful things all day long. You know, this young generation that are coming through now are uh, uh, a liberal in a very positive way. And, and, and weirdly, I mean, like, you know, an act I was saying earlier about, you know, the staff night out and the kitchen porter, uh, sorry, the chef getting, you know, a bit sick in the morning. Like, I see a huge difference in the chefs now. They're much more mature at a younger age about things like that, about, like, going out and partying and, and sort of they're, they're a bit more career-driven. Um, so, yeah, I think there's, there's positive change kind of across the board in leaders and in, in the young people coming through. And I know that some people will disagree with that and some people will say oh you know young people nowadays have, have not got the work ethic but that's also on you as a leader to put that into them right and to inspire people and make them excited and not just be that moany old man saying oh you know you lot you don't know what it was like back in the day they don't give a sorry like they don't <laughs> care what you went through when you were young they don't so we're, we're living in the now do you know what i mean so yeah, inspire people, treat them well, and, and we'll have a very, very healthy workforce in the future. Yeah, and I think, well, there's also finding that balance, because um, I think, you know, how kitchens, kitchens, um, what kitchens taught me, I was wayward, so I, I, it gave me discipline. You know, the reason why I got kicked out of school when I was 13, it's not because I was too clever for them, and they thought, you know what, we're holding you back, go out and do your thing. It's because, I, you know, I, I, I was trouble, and that that so i don't always look back at the you know the old days as it were and look at it as, a, as almost like a negative thing what it did do it, it it taught me to control myself and gave me something to channel that all of that pent-up energy with 
but it, it gave me discipline. So, you know, for us, obviously, we have a laugh and a joke, but when it, you know, th- there is also that sense of um, routine and discipline. So, yeah, because that's the only way it, it works. And I think it also helps the, the younger co- uh, guys who, mm. who are in our kitchen almost focus themselves as well. So we've got, you know, a couple of the kids, you know, they've been with us since we started and, and, and they're incredible. And it's amazing how they've um, uh, developed over the last three years. But, you know, th- th- there have been times where you have to instill a bit of discipline in them. Yeah. Before no, they, I, agree, I, own, yeah, I right? agree with that totally. 100% I agree with you on that. And, and um, it's obviously uh, done in yeah. a fair way. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And we, we have that in our kitchen, right? So we do have, I think, a very friendly environment to work in. But when we need to be serious, we're serious, right? And the same thing, and I, I gave a kind of uh, a talk to the chefs the other day about personal discipline, right? About that thing, that famous phrase of, you know, doing the right thing when nobody's looking, right? When you do that, your career sort of soars. And uh and I, I agree as well, you know, I remember the first time in a really decent restaurant, a sous chef kind of ripped me to shreds. I me- I'll never forget it. I said to the kitchen pour, if I see him outside of work, I'm going to glass him. Right? And I meant it. I totally meant it. And he laughed at me, laughed in my face, this kitchen pour. He was like, you, you're going you're gonna to learn a lot here. Don't worry. And I think within a couple of weeks, I kind of got my head around that, that like it is fairly normal, this thing. But um, that's a fine balance, I think, uh, because not many people made it through that system, right? And I saw lots and lots of people fall through the cracks because fair, fair enough, you shout at someone for like 18 hours a day in their face, you, you've got to have a certain mentality to be able to take that, yeah, right? Yeah. Um, so I don't think that that's, you know, a necessary thing at all, but you're right. And I think, yeah, still 100% having, you know, that discipline of, of, somebody being strict about themselves and the way they work and being clean and tidy and, and punctual and making sure they're on time on a check and all of those things need to be there but we just don't need to scream and shout at chefs all day long how do you make sure that that happens across the board in kitchens though because it's great that obviously you have that mindset Callum but how do you make sure that 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 feeds through the whole industry because you know it's not an easy an easy task is it no, it's not. It's not easy because, you know, each chef's kitchen is his castle to an extent. Right. But I think if we talk about it openly, some people might take some of that stuff on board. Some might not. But talking about it and being open about it, that's the beginning. Right. And and understanding that it's for the good of our industry, because these are the young kids coming through. They're going to be the chef to parties in, you know, three, four years. There'll be the sous chefs, and you know, a few years after that. So, you know, let's nurture people from an, an early age now and make sure that the future's bright for the industry. You know, there are people who've been through our kitchen where sadly they've just not cut the mustard, but we've given them the opportunity. We've given them a month to work with us. And if we're not seeing, because we can give you the opportunity, but you've got to take it with open arms yeah. and embrace it and, 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 and milk it for everything you can. If you're just there to take up space in the kitchen and just so you can take pictures on Instagram saying this is what I'm doing and this is the food I'm putting together, then, you know, and, and not put the, the graft in or develop, then sadly we're going to have to part company. Is social media quite distracting for, for young chefs? Because obviously that's something that you guys wouldn't have dealt with. So is, it, is that a distraction? <laughs> I've never thought about it before, but I suppose it's that generation, isn't it? So. <laughs> Yeah, not everyone. Quite, a, quite a, yeah. I think it plays a big part in that it would be sort of ignorant to say that it doesn't play a big part in sort of young generation at the moment. It does to me, and I'm sure Acto uses, you know, social media a lot as well to promote business. But um, it's just times change, and you have to kind of understand that that's kind of part of it now. Um, but yeah, I, I think if I, if I catch people dancing on, uh, TikTok in the kitchen. I'm probably gonna <laughs> fact pack the phone for a while. You know what I mean? <laughs> Callum, I wanted to talk to you as we're on social media about your your post in January about your um ten years sober because I think that's amazing. Yeah. Uh, and congratulations because that is thank you, thank unbelievable. you. Congrats. And I just wanted to talk about that kind of journey if you don't mind about how you know why you decided that you needed to do that and then obviously how tough or maybe not tough those ten years have been. Yeah. I mean, 
<laughs> I'm going to start off softly with this. <laughs> the reason I made the decision to, to stop drinking was because I was going to die. Right. <laughs> there it is. Right. That's I mean, that's the reality of it. I was just I was very close to dying uh, when I was 29 years old. And um, I, you know, my drinking had been from the very, very beginning. You know, the first time I had a drink when I was in my early teens had been different to everybody else I knew in the, you know, I would always drink to get as drunk as possible. Um, and weirdly, the the sort of career that I decided to go into, our industry, <laughs> in a way slightly allowed me to mask how bad it was over the years, right? Um, because, you know, when I was cooking, first cooking in central London, uh, when I was young, most chefs went out every night, right? It was kind of one of those things. And I and, and I remember, you know, when uh, I was at the Ivy, when I, you know, the original Ivy, um, we would get the chefs come over from, from Lindsay House, which was uh, Richard's restaurant back then, um, would come over to ours to borrow equipment at like one in the morning to do prep, right? This is back when like service used to finish that late. And then we would meet them after service and go out drinking. And then we'd be back in the kitchen at 7.30, 7 o'clock in the morning, right? And that was pretty normal behavior. So to an extent, I could kind of hide how bad it was. And then it just got worse and worse over the years. And to the point where... Uh, it went from me just drinking heavily to being physically addicted to alcohol, like fully physically addicted. Now, uh, yeah, I, don't, I think a lot about this, right, about how, you know, you see uh, someone sent me a video tonight, actually, uh, on WhatsApp. And it was, you know, uh, uh, a, a woman walking down the street naked in a part of London and sort of people filming her. And I thought, well, you know. It's one of two things. She's got mental illness or, you know, she's got a really bad drug problem. And, and one thing that quite a lot of people don't grasp with addiction is that it completely overrides any sense of, of good or bad or, you know, how you affect other people. It's only about getting that uh, balance back in your body of, of normality, which is, you know, the right amount of endorphin which is released by whatever drug or alcohol you're taking um and that was the point i got to right? i got to that level of addiction where uh i didn't really care who i hurt anymore in terms you know not physically but emotionally you know i didn't really ever prioritize how you know my family's feelings or, or my girlfriend's feelings and uh and if i didn't drink with within 30 minutes or an hour I'd be sick I'd be really physically ill I'd be shaking and tremors and and I was working right I was I was you know the sous chef in a pretty decent restaurant at the time when it was really bad and uh and it got to a point where I had to leave work and um I was I moved back in with my family and was just kind of locked in an attic right and I was still at that point sort of in denial that I could help myself and would you know say to my family and friends don't worry and I'm gonna sort myself out um but I wasn't like I was I you know I couldn't at that point and uh I yeah I, I even remember god it was just nuts things I went to a account like a, a counselor through my GP and uh and I was telling I never remember this really clearly I was telling her you know, yeah, this is how much I'm drinking a day and, and you know, I'm doing my best to not drink before 12. I literally had a bottle of vodka tucked in my trousers while I was talking to her. And, you know, as, as soon as I walked out of the room, I had to drink it because I was going to get sick. So I was pretty bad, right? And, uh, yeah, and it just got to a point where um, I knew I was going to die. Like, I was, you know, my liver was very swollen, uh, I was in constant pain. I couldn't, there was no other way out the other side. So I gave up and I was just like, well, that's it now. I'll just kind of just go out with it, whatever. Uh, and then there was a morning, must have been the, the next day or a couple of days later, where I think just that survival instinct kicked in. Something switched in my brain. 
And I rang my brother and said, look, if I don't do something pretty serious now, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be done. And he said, look, I've been waiting for you to make that decision for years. So uh, let's get you into a rehab as quickly as possible. And that was it. And I spent a month in rehab and, and never drank again. <laughs> And it was the best thing I've ever done in my life. And, and when you asked that question earlier about what's your proudest moment, I was like, it was like the getting married, you know, the cookbook. Um, it sounds really selfish, but it probably was coming out of rehab sober because I never thought I could get out the other side of that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and looking back now, 10 years, and how mm. far you've come like I mean I think you, you deserve to have that as your proudest moment you should be really proud of yourself to get to get to that point was it was it was it hard over those 10 years to stick to that or do you think once you'd made that decision that you were done that that was it, it know, was a lot easier so when I went into rehab I kind of went in and sort of batch of people who all got sort of managed to get a place in that rehab at the same time and I think out of about 30 people, two people have stayed sober. Um, and one of the things was, you know, a lot of people couldn't get their heads around the thing of like, you, you can't ever drink again, right? You can't ever do drugs again. You can't do anything. That bit of your life is done, right? And a lot of people struggled with that, really struggled hard. And I saw people in there who were very, you know, like very successful people and they couldn't, I mean, these are people that could make, you know, really serious sort of business decisions at work and stuff like that, but they couldn't figure that bit out. It was too hard for them. It was too much of a deal of like, okay, in 20 years, I can't have a glass of champagne at my daughter's graduation or something. Uh, but for me, what worked was somebody, somebody in there said to me once, they basically just explained it scientifically to me, what I'd done to my brain. They kind of explain the chemical process of how I'd knackered it right I got it to a point where um it wasn't just about being able to cut back I'd taken it to a point of no return um and when they explained to me like that I was like all right I get that I understand it now that's laid out I can move on with my life um you know it, instead of just going on about willpower or you know higher power of God and stuff like that it was just black and white this is the science of it so you do what that, you know, do what it with what you will with that information. And um, and it was the best bit of information anyone ever gave me. And it just, I guess it's different, you know, different things work for different people. But um the first few years were fairly tough. Uh, I'm not gonna lie, you know, it's uh I, I went back to working straight into the industry, and you know, my group of friends, my large group of friends were all chefs. That was it, really. I didn't have friends outside of uh, outside of chefs, and I remember one of the first times we went to a pub, probably about a year, maybe, maybe like a year in, after getting sober, and one of my friends was flicking beer at me, and he was like, "Are you gonna, are you gonna start drinking or what?" And I was like, "Man, like, if I can't get through this stuff mentally, then uh, you know, I'm done. This is probably as hard as it's gonna get." Um, and, and I've had some other tests since then, you know, with people sort of challenging me about alcoholism and stuff. But one big thing for me was being able to just tell my story and, and to tell other people, you know, I, I managed to get out the other side and survive and, and I've made, you know, a career for myself. So people that are struggling in our industry and feel alone and feel that that, you know, other people aren't going through what they're going through. Maybe if they see me talking about it, it might help them, um, which is why I've made the decision to talk about it after 10 years. Um, because people can judge, right? People, you know, the, the people always will. Uh, but it's a fairly small percentage of people that do, to be honest with you. But um, fuck those people. <laughs> you know I mean? yeah. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, uh, I, I think... It is very hard within our industry because you're right. It's something that it's always around, isn't it? And it's, mm. it's especially like you say with chefs. That's part. Of, well, when we socialise, sadly, it seems to be that drink is very much part of that, you know, and 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 it's part and possible. So I don't think you know. Hats off to you for for being able to 
to to to to abstain and stay away from that because yeah i mean at the end of the day you've made a decision for yourself for your own health and for the for the greater good that you that's that wasn't for you and and you've managed to obviously well yeah 10 years that's absolutely incredible i mean myself like i'm a i'm a yo-yo smoker like i I can Mm. go 10 years without it and then i'll start and then you know something will trigger it and you know i admire you for being able to like my my you know smoking is my bad habit and it's the one that i really struggle yeah. with. and like i said i had i had a 10 year stretch where i didn't and then the last year year and a half i have and it started off with a cheeky one here and then it's just it's it always starts off with that and it's just incredible i admire you so much for being able to to just to, to stay away from it and and you know it does Thank take you. a lot especially in our industry as well when it's around you all the time but you know i think i think as things are you know, I think as people's work-life balances start to change, I think as the industry is changing, as we aren't working as long as we used to, things are changing within our industry. I think the four-day mm-hmm. week is becoming quite a common thing. So you, you're not always going out so hard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I 100% agree with that, yeah. right? Yeah, because I think that was partly why we used to go so hard when we went out, was because you felt 100% that you were owed it. Right. Like, no, I've worked like 90, 100 hours this week when we're going out like the police can't stop us. Do you know what I mean? There is no law. I remember like, <laughs> yeah, my God, some of the behavior when we used to go out as groups of chefs. But it was like, yeah, it genuinely was that. It was sort of like Brits abroad, you know, you see on TV and people are just like, oh, I'm in another country. I can't get nicked. Right, that's how we used to behave it, but in London, right? And and, I, and when people did get nicked, they couldn't believe it, right? And you hear them arguing with the police, going, "Do you know how fucking hard I've worked this week?" And the police are like, "Doesn't really matter, mate, for what you've just done." Um, yeah, and I think you're right. I think as that work-life balance has sort of uh, changed a little bit, people don't feel so sort of aggrieved at not being able to go out and get at absolutely wasted when they go out but um yeah i'm uh so yeah look i'm i'm not uh somebody who's preachy about alcohol at all anyone that sort of knows me well knows that uh i just i know that everybody is different and uh i do my best to support people that are going through things but that's a very private matter and i've always kept it that way um, because I understand firsthand the sort of stigma that can be attached with it. So um, I do want to say that if anyone is listening to this and does want some advice or just wants to chat or know somebody that, you know, they're concerned about, please do feel free to sort of reach out to me on social media, you know, direct message, and I'll do my best to sort of, you know, give you all the time I can for somebody to be able to get help and for it to be beneficial they need to want it right and that's kind of a tough part of addiction is that sometimes you need to get to a point to get there to want that help um and yeah and that's often like the most difficult conversations i have with people is about that sort of thing but because i was offered help endlessly yeah i think well just you like you said being honest and talking about it that's sometimes just what people need to to hear isn't it because like yeah. said, it's, it's something very private that maybe they don't think other people have gone through you always think a bit insular don't you so I think yeah you absolutely just to say this is my experience I think will help so many people so yeah and you can and you can have a normal life all right that was a big you know that was one of the things that scared me the most I think about n- not drinking was that I was going to go into some sort of weird life where I I'd be, you know, in AA meetings twice a day, every day of the week. But actually, I've got a pretty normal life now, you know, and I just I'm just disciplined with myself mentally. But um, yeah, if you know, if if you make the right sort of changes in your in your head, not everyone, because other people struggle with it more, but you know, majority of people, if you get it right, you can have a pretty damn good life. I've got an amazing wife. And I have a nice life. I'm surrounded by lovely people. Um, and I'm trying my best to make a success of myself and and sort of have lots of lovely things happen in my career now. So, yeah, things things can be much better. Our industry is starting to also appreciate and, and understand 
that you can have a great time, you know, on the, on the customer end as well, because I think the whole non-out flight, especially on the fine dining end, mm. you either, yeah, I mean, you either had a wine flight or you drank water and, and the, you know, yeah. whatever, you know, with your meal, where, you know, the, the, the non-out flights are becoming quite a, a very interesting thing. A lot of restaurants are doing really good jobs of like I was at Fran yeah, yeah. uh, last year, obviously before lockdown, and, 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 and I actually found their non-out flight better than their wine flight so the second time yeah. i just i didn't bother with the wine flight i just had the non yeah. I, you know we offer it here and a few quite a few restaurants are starting to do that so i think you know, the industry is starting to understand and and, and 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 appreciate that and giving people options yeah to be able to to enjoy the whole experience without feeling as though they're missing out yeah absolutely i mean I, the first time I saw it because I mean, like, I've got 10 years now of drinking non-alcohol drinks in, in restaurants, right? So I've kind of seen, you know, restaurants like three stars in Paris where they laugh at you. They literally laugh at you. And I've been <laughs> in Mexico City where I told them I don't drink alcohol and they offered me beer instead, right? Because this <laughs> beer is an alcohol. Um, but then I've seen the like amazing side of it. Like We were doing uh, a week at a restaurant called Gastrologic in Sweden. And I was there with my sous chef. We were doing sort of collaboration week with the restaurant. And there, the 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 bar team come up with the ideas for the for the non-alcoholic pairings, and then they give those ideas to the kitchen, and the kitchen work on the the drinks as they as though they were dishes, right? As though they were the two star level dishes that they're cooking in the restaurant. And the level of complexity that went into each di- each drink was the same as creating a menu dish, and and it blew me away. And and you know I, that really inspired me. I just kind of went away from that. And, but do that, that level of detail that's gone into making that guest feel welcome who doesn't drink is is amazing. And it's very normal over there in in the sort of Nordic countries for that to happen now, and, and more so now I'm seeing in the UK as well. And there's a lot of chefs doing it here now, and it's, it's fantastic. Yeah. Well, staying with being inspired, my final question for you both mm. is, um, what would be the perfect pie between for you and Akhtar if you made one together? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I've okay, got an idea. Chat with him. <laughs> I, I mean, we haven't discussed this, right? But I, I did kind of have an idea because I, so I've got a, I've got a pie on at the restaurant, which is a curried mutton pie, right? And it's not authentic in any manner, right? And it's based on uh, a curried lamb pie that I had in New Zealand when I was there with my wife, you know, a few years ago, or quite a few years ago now. Um, and it is, you know, it, based on that sort of like football stadium, balti pie, you know, it's not, it's not in any way like an authentic Indian recipe, uh, Indian recipe. And, um, I, when we were starting to think about it, I had a guy working with us in the hotel um, called Palash Mitra, who was originally, he was head chef of uh, Jim Khanna. Um, and he came to work with us in one of our restaurants and, you know, super talented guy and I said to him Palash if we could work on this recipe together actually going to make it pretty authentic and 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 take it up a level um I'd love to do that and then he fucked off to Hong Kong to work over there so it never happened right but I've always kind of been like I would love to kind of do it and I know that actor you do on the at home menu you do it there's a mutton dish right we do. Uh, we work with uh, quite a few, um, quite a few recipes. But yeah, slow stewed muttons always mm. in, the, in the menus that we is do. It, and it's like, is it Parsi? Parsi, yeah. So it's a yeah, Parsi gosh, is it? That's right. Yeah. So it's um, yeah, come from the uh, the Parsi community. But yeah, it's a lovely fragrant sauce in a lo- nice bit of acidity in the background and a little bit of heat. Mm. You know, and, and we tend to use the more gelatinous parts of uh, the mutton as well. So from the shoulder, the forward quarter. Yeah. Of it, you know, it's, it's really unctuous. Uh, yeah. So yeah. So, yeah, I mean, that I was going to say that or there's a, another recipe that we do with um, actually with veal shin. Um, mm. it's, uh, it's, a t- it's a style of korma going back to the original the roots of it, the Persian influences. So it's very aromatic. So it's like a, a spiced uh, demi 
essentially where the the actual veal shin is cooked and then you knock out all the uh, bone marrow from obviously the osabuco and then yeah. you multiply that back into the sauce and you finish it off with green and black cardamom so it's like super like the oh aroma. that sounds good <laughs> does, doesn't it <laughs> that sounds good <laughs> If this, if this pie happens, I want one. Just saying, because yeah. it was my idea. <laughs> I'm gonna call. I'll call it the Akhtar Kara pie. How's that sound? All right. It was yeah. born here in this podcast. <laughs> that on the branding there, because if that was on the menu, I wouldn't order it. So... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Actually, I didn't think about the wording of that. Yeah. <laughs> we'll come up with a different name. Amazing. Well, I'm going to let you go come and get your dinner since you haven't had your dinner. <laughs> but thank, thank you, you both so much. I've really, really enjoyed it. Thank you for being so honest, at Callum. And like you said, you know, if people do want to chat, then they can easily reach out to you on social media, which I think is amazing. Um, Akhtar, it's been a pleasure as always. And um, I will speak to you for our, for our next episode. But yes, yeah, thank you both very much. Thanks so much for having me on. Thank you. Um, Thank no, you very no, much, guys. It's been incredible chatting to you, mate. And yeah, your, your story is just, yeah, it's amazing, man. So now I've just got to just give up Siggy's, but. <laughs> 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 Thank you, Eric Tom. Thank you. This episode of Grilled is sponsored by Rationale, your leading provider in multifunctional hot food preparation equipment. Register now for a free Rationale live demo at www.rationale-online.com.